Hi folks, welcome to Andy's Photo Show. It's 8 p.m. Central European time right here at a beautiful Bruges, Belgium. So we must be talking photography. Welcome one and all to episode 12 of Andy's Photo Show. Here we are and here we go. Tonight we're going to be talking about Winter Hulud, which is Winter Glow, if you want to give it a bit of an English tilt. That is a light festival that's been happening now in its second year in Bruges, this beautiful medieval city in Belgium. And I've been out there taking a few photos and it being the second edition and a little bit of a new festival. Well, some of us are still discovering that this thing even exists regionally and internationally. Obviously, internationally, you're probably not coming to Bruges right now. So this might be some interesting notes for next year. And I guess if you can't make it to Bruges, it's a uh, chance to see a little bit of our city, hey? As we do so much on Andy's Photo Show, with me being based in my photography out of this gorgeous city, you get to see a little bit of Bruges as we go. So there's that. Welcome one and all, and why don't we just get on with things? We try and keep it under an hour or thereabouts here. I guess before anything else, before we start talking about night photography in a light trail kind of way, like winter glow. I should put on my <clears throat> Christmas attire. Let me just go back to live view so I can make this look not too ridiculous. There we go. Hope you can see that. Yep, there we go. Merry Christmas from all to all, including me to you. This was purchased last year when I visited Montreal from a dollar store. And we obviously have way more obnoxious Christmas material, but we'll keep it limited to this. So happy Christmas, everyone. I'm not going to be drinking on the show tonight, so you're going to have to make do with this. Hope you like my tie. <laughs> Mrs. Andy's in the corner, of course, taking backstage shots. So look out for that and all that sort of social media stuff. Yes, boys and girls, why don't we just get on with things? Let me go to Broadcasting Central and, uh, well, just throw down to the corner there so you can see what I'm seeing on my screen. Actually, we'll get to the web browser side of things later as we talk about the night photography with Winter Glow. Right now, I just want to pop into Lightroom so I can, uh, well, I don't know, maybe just perhaps remind you to love everything in photography because that's how it works and that's how you get the results. Creativity, heart, and passion are one side of the coin when you're making the art and, you know, speaking from the soul right here. So that side of the coin must be cherished, endorsed, and uh, celebrated, if you will. It's certainly part of the love that will get you forward in your photography or otherwise. And just remember the practical love, that part where you do the work. The part where you spend more than 50 bucks on a camera because you need the extra technical power, like in night photography, where you spend two minutes on the scene so that, you know, you just fully dissect things instead of that 10 second snap and go. You might get the crowd out of your way so you get a more pleasing shot of the architecture. You might find a new angle that you were looking for, or you might just soak in the scene a little more and have a warm memory when you think of it down the road on that love side. It's practical, but they dip in move over. And last but not least, boys and girls, getting the knowledge, doing the practice, you know, even sitting through Andy's photo show and all his ramblings and silly Christmas ties, all that is part of the practical love called education and knowledge. So I endorse that 10,005% as we talk about the love this fine week in photography. All right, let me just click over and make sure everything's working. Yes, it is indeed. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to leave one wherever you are watching this fine, fine episode. If you uh, just tune in late or want to catch this later, don't forget we're on youtube.com forward slash Andy McPhoto. So that had to be mentioned before we could do anything. That way the tax man is happy that I'm marketing myself. Woo! -hoo. All right, boys and girls, before we get into the night photography, of course, has has become tradition very quickly here on Andy's Photo Show. I have to run you through my last week in Bruges, what's been up on the camera and what's been going on with Andy and the beautiful city of Bruges. It's actually been a fairly quiet week. If we zoom out, you can see, what, only 21 photos that are really representing this week and they're quick ones. Then we get into the, uh, the winter glow side of things. Main thing this week for not having many photos of the outdoors of Bruges has been 
the release of my book and, you know, it existing in the physical world in that kind of way. Bruges Landscapes, Unlocked for Light, a story of space, silence, and simplicity is now on the bookshelf, so to speak. It's at least available through me, so you're welcome to check that out. And actually, you can get one or two copies over at the book handle on the Daver here in Bruges, if you happen to be in the city of Bruges. But photography-wise, it's mostly been to the side with paperwork getting done. You know, some international orders of the fine book has gone down, so we have paperwork to fill out. Thank you, Belgian Post, for introducing four of each copy for that just before Christmas. Luckily, I get off the hook, because that's not my hand. That's the hand of my wife, who not only sits in the corner for these episodes, keeping me sane and tolerable, but also packs up these beautiful books and kind of keeps track of it all. I mean, I'm the uh, pretty face of the company in one way or another, but she's the reality of the hard work backstage. And you can see a little bit of it in our backstage life here at Photo Tour Bruges slash Andy McSweeney Photography in the kitchen while she's uh, laying out the books to get ready to ship out in one way or another in her gorgeous creative space uh, that fills up my belly at the end of the day. So that's been nice. And we've been showing the book around town. You can see this is a little bit of a confusing story, but will make sense in just a second. I mean, if you're delivering this thing and people say, hey, I hear you have a book, you're going to show it. And this is Walter moving on from just book talk. He has been um, on a hunger strike now into, I believe it's eighth day. He's aiming for 14 days. As you can see by the sign in the background, this is him on day one, and he's striking not just for the hell of it, but for climate control awareness. You know, the, um, the leaders out there, both local and otherwise, have made some promises about getting to carbon neutral targets and just reducing our waste in one way or another. And he's on this hunger strike to bring awareness to the fact that some of those uh, targets and promises may not be met at the current rate of things. You know, the global lockdown in spring reduced 0 0.001 of our carbon footprint to give you an idea if you haven't seen the news. And this is the kind of story around Bruges that I love to share around because it shows somebody caring about something. And in particular, Walter's caring about his greater community by, uh, you know, risking his health and certainly depriving himself of some beautiful Belgian food just to get the word out there. And it's a challenge. I mean, luckily, the press does drop by. This is Benny Prout, who is one of the freelance and contract journalist photographers around town and around this region of West Flanders. He works for, I believe, Het Laster News. And there you get to hear a little bit of my Flemish. And it was good to see they dropped by and that there was an article over in uh, at Last News. Let's see some more before Walter finishes his hunger strike, because, I mean, it's hard to get attention. As you can see here in the next shot, you know, there's some video cameras being set up. And also, I guess, photographically, how I'm sort of playing around and trying to get a different take on Walter with him being so central and so many photos getting taken. But we need those important photos taken also. I mean, this is our good mayor, Mayor DeFal, as many of you know. He was actually out talking about a different thing, but I thought it was interesting to sort of weave together the story of what he was talking about, as well as Walter's story and what he's talking about with climate control. Hopefully we'll see a little mutual press go on and some endorsement from the city for this kind of, you know, action and... Uh, thought and care towards the future of our city. Personally, I endorse it. Don't ask me anything beyond that. Politics are confusing enough in any language. And stepping away from Walter and focusing on Mayor Defau just for that little press moment that I had him and uh, what is it, VT, VTV Focus, who are doing the video side of things. Well, I put my camera shutter on silent so I'm not disturbing the interview and I grab a couple of photos that I think tell the story of Mayor Defau giving a, a little press moment in one way or another. We won't talk about why it was a press moment this one. You locals know that College of Bruges is a whole discussion so let's just leave it at that shall we? Anywho, oh look at that there's some life around town and that's John the Waffle Man taking a look at a copy of my book. 
Bruges landscapes, unlocked for light. There's my wife's parents and my in-laws looking at a copy of my book, Bruges Landscapes, Unlocked for Light. There's Isabel from Karma Mart looking at my book while well, looking away, but about to look at my book, Bruges Landscapes, Unlocked for Light. And while we're talking about Isabel and her lovely Karma Mart shop, which is zero waste because you bring in your plastic and she fills it up, you can see some of the beautiful little community moments that that young lady has been uh, thriving and growing over at that beautiful little shop on the Langstrad. So a bit of Bruges life there. And Bruges life from there in the last week, at least as far as I've seen it, has been pretty loose and minimal beyond the book, let's be honest here. I mean, this is a little bit of an abstract moment, let's not lie, but it's Part of what everyone's doing right now with the lack of tourists and, you know, a, a Christmas that we're essentially keeping it low and uh, on the mellow. It may not be the most exciting photo in the world, boys and girls, but I like a photo of Yoss's freshly cleaned chair by the boats. These are guys that I hang around and like to uh, chit chat to, take photos of during the normal time of season, whether it's their lives, whether it's the boats that they're working on and that life there. Or those little bits of life that may look a little weird out of context, but uh, keep my photo muscles going and keep telling the story of this city. And little stories of the city that I've just caught in passing include this theme that I'm doing with the reflections in the water here in the canals. It's uh, something I've been building up for about six years now. You can go down my social stream, either as Photo Tour Bruges or Andy McPhoto on Facebook or Instagram and see a bunch of these somewhere in there. It would have been my next book if it hadn't been for this whole lockdown situation and the decision to um, focus on the Bruges Landscapes book that I eventually put out. But that's caught in the last week and it's going to be considered towards this upcoming book in future. Excuse me, I have a little lozenge. It's not, it's not drinking booze this week, gang. We had a we had a West Fleeter in for my birthday last week, and by the end of it, I'm not sure what I was saying. And speaking of stuff, and not quite sure what you're saying, but putting it out there anyways, this is something I've been playing with, and a particular scene that I saw. It's I, it's essentially Bruges with the uh, construction going on for a bit of contrast and a bit of story and a bit of you know, beyond the postcard life that I think you boys and girls know for the longest time I've liked to focus on next to the postcard life that I catch here and there. So little story beyond the basics and uh, typical Bruges, which I think is a good thing and part of why I'm actually quite excited to talk about Winterglow tonight or Winterglood, and we'll do that shortly. But you can also see one from the, you know, last few days where I've worked on the construction theme Freshly laid out cobblestone signs, all that sort of stuff. That's part of what I'm looking out for right now. And uh, who knows? Maybe it'll go somewhere. So there's that. And so there's this. This uh, I almost forgot about in our weekly recap that we do here on Andy's Photo Show of Life in Bruges. But this is something that's a little teaser uh, of something I've got to catch over the next week which is this really beautiful outdoor installation by Frederick, Frederick van Pamel. And he has a, uh, a florist shop, and I believe also they sell antiques and things there, don't they, dear? Yep, antiques also. Yeah. And Frederick really went all out this year for the uh, display side of things outside the shop. I mean, these are just two quick little shots that I caught in the afternoon as I finally had a chance to uh, dip over that side of town and check it out. But this all lights up at night, and, you know, if you're living in Bruges, kind of like the Winter Flood Festival, don't be afraid to check out Frederick and his awesome, awesome work. Oh, and hey, while you're there, he's one of our local shops. So, like any local shop, if you're in town and need something for Christmas, pick something up and support him so he can get through these tough times. Be able to do these future displays uh, in years to come. Pretty. Pretty, pretty, and these test shots only give you a little sample barely a taste of it. All right. So that was the last week in Bruges. And here we are. Let me just click over to Facebook and see what's going on. If we have comments, questions, or any of that sort of thing, everything looks fine. So everything is fine. I hope everyone over there is fine on the other side of the camera. 
He says just calling up Photo Tour Bruce so we can check for questions. And I mean that, folks, you know, we're going into the long days of winter and this vaccine is out in the wind, but it's not happened yet. Hey, Dimitri, I see ya. But yeah, make sure whether it's waving at each other over Facebook as we do live shows, whether it's clicking the love button to those waves, whether it's interacting in the real world one way or another, that you're uh, looking after each other as much as possible and, you know, helping us all get through these dark days together because that's what we got to do. And that's just a little reminder on the mental health. It has not that much to do with photography, but I hope it reminds you that we got to keep the love strong for each other and it killed two minutes while I checked for questions. Anywho, onwards and upwards from that, folks. Let me just have a look. You're still seeing me in the corner of the screen. Why don't I click back? Because you see we have some winter glow photos to go through. But I think at this juncture it would make sense to go back live into color. So hello. We're going to start talking about winter glow photos. And in case you're just tuning in, welcome to my Christmas tie. It was purchased at a dollar store in Canada last year, and I am immensely proud of it. Look at how it reflects all the light in here. Oh my. Happy Christmas, everybody. <laughs> and with that said, and back on full screen, I want to talk to you about Winter Hlud, uh, the Winter Glow Festival that I've mentioned already a couple times in the show, because it's the focus of this episode. I actually want to sort of open it up also to night photography because I think this is something that obviously connects being in the night. These are based around light installations and moving moving situations with crowds and such. But I think a lot of the principles are fairly universal when you're talking about night photography. And without, you know, getting too long before we get back to photos of winter glow and you don't have to look at me wearing this tie or at least you know, have me shoved into the corner in black and white. Let me show you a few things and, you know, ways I'm thinking when I get ready for night photography. I mean, first and foremost with night photography, just like any photography, but in particular with night, you're going to want to think about preparation. Preparation is key in this respect because night photography is, as, as a way of shooting, by nature with the lower light, with a lot more things to consider from longer exposures and such to, uh, you know, just the reality of it being dark, you're going to want to prepare as much as possible. And, you know, this can be the sensible stuff. It's the cold months of the year, so you're going to want to dress warm. Night photography tends to go slow, so you can probably plan for at least two hours, even if you're doing a, a relatively short thing like winter, winter hood or even just part of it over a few nights session. So, I mean... It may sound boring and not very photography specific, but you want to dress warm. You know, you see on the show a lot, I wear this old military vest and it's not because I've served and luckily no one's kicked my ass for it. Um, but it's warm, you know, that along with an extra jumper as along with my um, hardcore warm jacket means that while I'm out there, I'm not getting chilly and I'm not going like this while I'm trying to focus on a shot. So dress warm, be sensible, wear the hat. If you wear gloves, did I grab them in time? Do, 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 do. Ah, yes, of course, I put them on the floor before the show. I like a soft hat, just on the last of the clothing, because I can put it in my pocket. Usually something that breathes makes sense. So this is wool and loosely knit. And actually, more critically, I think for photography, think about the fingerless gloves. The fact that tip of your fingers are going to be a little chillier, but you'll be able to reach the buttons or use the touch screen, depending if you have it or not, I think makes it worthwhile to consider for photography. And like I talked about a couple episodes for um, uh, gift ideas for photographers, photography gloves are essentially fingerless gloves. And if you don't want your fingers to get too chilly, yes, of course, you can get the ones where they fold over and you'll be warm again. So you have options just like cameras there's a thousand things you can buy, and this is just a little thought there. Now, moving on from the wardrobe side of things into the good stuff, which is the gear. Think again about the preparation side of things. I mean, cleaning your camera sensor and your lenses is something that you'll definitely want to uh, consider a little bit extra for night photography. 
there will be some stray light from lamps or just by the nature of how it capture, captures photos and then, you know, can burn in a little piece of dust more aggressively than a daytime photo. I really, really recommend you take the time before you go out shooting just to clean down your camera system as much as you can. Now, obviously, you got a couple of options. You can get some nice, uh, I, what is it, Ibo, Ibo Prusil? I can never say it, but some lens cleaning uh, solution. You can get it at the pharmacy if you ask for lens cleaner. And obviously, you can buy it commercially. I would uh, also bring one of these on location, which is a wind blower for a dust blower, let's call it. It blows wind, but it's for the dust. You can hear it right there in the microphone. And that means that while you're out there and you see a piece of dust, you don't have to get out a cloth and maybe have to rub it three times just to be able to get it fully clean and get that dust bit off. You just poof into the lens and then you're clear and good to go. So that definitely for night photography, I find very, very invaluable. And then by extension, I also find it useful to have one of these lens pens, which you probably know, they're a very popular item. You've got your little wipey wipey, softy softy French tickler, because hey, it's that kind of show and we can joke like that. So that means that you can, again with that dust, just go like this over the lens and you'll be good to go to clean it there. And if you have something a little more aggressive, well, obviously the other end of this lens pen, let's see if it's showing up on camera. Yep, this is essentially microfiber technology integrated into this uh, plastic nub. And what it means is you can, let's take a lens, clean the lens a little more thoroughly. Whoa, look at that on camera. There we go. And then be able to really dig in if there's a piece of dirt, moisture, what have you. So those two items, definitely, definitely got to bring these on the knife photography shooting. Those just make bare sense. Obviously also in the no-brainer category would be cloths. Uh, microfiber cloths are really highly recommended. And again, just with the preparation side of things, make sure that they're as clean as possible. I believe the wife, when she's kind enough to wash mine, does them not in the machine, but just water with a little bit of soap. Draft. Draft. So a little bit of a, you know, kitchen soap and then let them soak, let them dry and you should be good to go. We don't get shit show up. Excuse my language. Oh, well, <laughs> welcome to 2020 live and alive. So yeah, cloths, all these cleaners are going to be no brainers. And as I mentioned for cleaning the camera system for the night shooting, also think about sensor cleaners. Now, I'm not sorry, I'm not going to open it up for the show, but this is a two pack that's made for my mirrorless camera, an APS-C sensor. And you can see I have these two little sticks where I take some of the cleaning solution also provided and put it on the sensor, give it a good solid wipe or two, and then I don't have to worry about any guck or muck on the sensor. And that's also, by the way, where this comes in handy. If you're using a mirrored or, or mirrorless camera, you'll have one way or another of getting at the sensor by taking off the lens and just blowing out the dust. One little bonus tip, tip I'd throw in for this little uh, blowy tickler thing is to um, hold the camera or the lens upside down when you do this. Go like that and the lens will uh, be free of dust, but it won't just catch it again in 10 seconds when it settles because you were doing it like this. So you go like that, the dust actually falls downwards and you minimize your chances there. So that's on the preparation side of things. Before we get into the uh, good stuff with the gear, I do actually have a camera sitting here next to me. I think on the gear side of things, as we sort of roll into it, and I just pause real, real quick to check the Facebook. Thank you, Johan. I'm glad you like my Christmas tie. But having said that, let's get on to the gear side of things with night photography. This might be familiar. We're shooting longer exposures by and large. If you're using an iPhone, you'll have less control or a smartphone in general, I should say. And this won't apply, but we're talking on the serious side of cameras here. So you're probably going to want to get a serious, nice, high resolution photo that isn't full of grain and noise. That means you're going to be thinking about stability in one way or another. And a monopod would be at least the very basic you have to consider towards uh, stabilizing your camera for that 
one or two seconds it might take at the very minimum. So a monopod makes sense. This is just a very basic one. You know, I click this out and obviously I'm on my way. I can add also for running around at night that it can be handy if you have some extra problems, but we're not going to worry about that for this talk, especially being in the beautiful city of Bruges. Just a little reminder, though, if you're in a dark alley doing some shooting and uh, things go weird. Anywho, moving away from violence and into the tripod side of things a little more aggressively. Before we get to the full-on tripod, I just want to remind you, of course, of little things like the Joby Gorilla Pod. This is a uh, little tripod system that obviously you can lay down, move around to how you need, so it's a little more straight up. You click through there and you can even move the tripod head as you need. And this can be a handy little thing. I mean, there are a there's a good thousand small tripod designs out there and you find what works for you, obviously. But I like this one. And I'd say certainly just make sure that you get one that gets uh, to support the weight of your camera properly. And also one of the things I like about a Gorilla Pod, sometimes I even throw it in next to my tripod just for the fact that I can wrap this around things. I've demonstrated it very loosely on past episodes, but because this system is very, very movable, flexible, you know, I can wrap it around something, not my arm if I want a couple seconds exposure, but let's say a pole, you know, a street lamp, whatever you need, you lock that on there and you can get, take a shot up high. So a little thought there with mini tripods in general, but certainly with a gorilla pod being an option on this uh, side of things for the night shooting. Moving on from that and getting into the serious tripods, you can see one in the background, of course. There is that one that has served me well over many years and got retired into a prop. It's your standard tripod that's already, you know, looking beyond the very basic and cheap side of things, by which I'm talking about 30 to $50, euros, pounds, whatever, and getting into $150, $200, euro, pound, that side of things directly. Now that's a worn out one. So why don't we see what I'm using currently? It goes beyond the couple hundred dollar, euro, pound side of things and gets a little more serious. This is a Manfrotto 055, model number scratched out just by sheer use. It is a higher end tripod and I'm gonna talk about why it can be worth having a hardcore tripod. Because I mean, I'd already at the $200 system uh, or level of things, when you start jumping around there and beyond, you're going to start noticing that compared to a $50 model, you know, unclicking the legs, being able to pull them out over time, that smoothness being fairly well preserved, that's already going to be a nice step up from things. And then you get to, you know, the fittings and where you're turning a dial so that you can loosen a head to, to move up. That's going to work better than it does, I find, on the uh, $50 mo model side of things. And when you get beyond a couple hundred dollars, I mean, you can see this tripod head. It's a serious bit of kit. Not to mention, if we hold this to the light carefully, see those little swirls in the black? That's because this is carbon fiber, so it's lighter. That's where you start crawling in quickly to $700, $1,000 side of things. And that's okay. I mean, this is also part of preparation. You, uh, you prepare enough that you prepare some money and prepare some savings and prepare some research and prepare some shopping so that you get the right tripod for the right job. And, you know, to get into the more advanced side of things when you get into these serious tripods, Already still at the couple hundred dollar level of things. Notice how the leg is extended. But here, I click this gray thing. Suddenly I can put that leg up. If I'm on a barrier for a canal, it might be useful to be able to pop this into the air for one reason or another. And when you get to the higher end models, I find these little features work out even smoother and just more precisely than even the uh, $200 models. But when we get to the real meat, and potatoes of it all, I mean, this is where a sophisticated and invested for a tripod head really makes a difference, doesn't it? 
And to explain what this one does, let me see for a second, because I'm looking at the camera while I'm doing this and trying to make sure, you know, the computer doesn't crash while Facebook's running. But essentially with this tripod head, I think the best way to show you is, let's see. Yeah, when I turn like that, do you see how it's changing the angle ever so subtly? And I'm doing big turns here, so <clears throat> let's say I'm just fine tuning. <coughs> and coughing away from the camera. Use. You can see that subtle, you know, within one degree turn that I can really fine tune everything with, especially with wide angle lenses, which get, get a little precise about things. That's super useful. And obviously I'm not stuck in this mode because as soon as I push this in, I can start doing major movements if I'm just doing my initial things or I realize I want something completely different out of the, uh, particular moment in particular shot. And that goes three ways. So I've got side to side, I've got tilty uppy downy, and I've got uh, the other axis that you would think about, but of course blanks on my head on air. That kind of investment, that kind of preparation, that makes a difference, doesn't it boys and girls? So something to consider about and part of why we were happy, well, not delighted, but happy to give up a holiday buying a friend's studio worth of gear, including this tripod. It cost us a trip to Croatia, but my night photography is better. So somehow I got away with that. Nice. Good job in photography if you want to get away with that, kids. And moving on from there, I think we can talk about a little more gear. Just clicking over, of course, over to the uh, Facebook to see if there are any live comments. My wife indicates that there are. I have been told again by Susie, since yes. Johan mentioned it, that I have a very fancy tie. Thank you very much. Am I going to be looking for the Jupiter-Saturn Jupiter, Jupiter -Saturn conjunction over there? Ah, a little astrophotography. I'll be looking into that, Susie. That's I've, tomorrow. That's tomorrow? Apparently we'll see, Susie. it's the Susie. first time in a long time that there's a, a certain constellation in the sky. Ah, the wife has just explained what's happening, <laughs> so I think we might be looking into it. I'll be looking into the weather, though, because I think in Bruges we are a bit rainy over the next week for Christmas. But, Susie, thank you for pointing that out. Awesome. How cool the comments get me learning something. I love it. All right, and I see Dimmy drooling probably over my tripod. So thank you very much for that. You better be gel. And Demi also adds for you people here in Bruges that that conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn will be happening at 1639, I believe, if that is what the random time he's throwing out is for. So I think that would be something to look out for, boys and girls. I would say for astrophotography, if you can, if you need a quick tip there, get as far out of the city and lights as you can. I mean, it's already a little bit tricky to catch the night sky. So here in Bruges, we've got a lucky escape out, out into the countryside. Just jump in the car, go five miles out, five kilometers out, five whatever you need to get out. And then uh, enjoy the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. My sister is the one to talk about this. She uh, definitely knows more about astro stuff than I do. But thank you, Susie. Awesome. I will give you a love before I go back to that. All right. I love this live, live show thing where we all get to learn stuff spontaneously. Poof. Like that I'm wearing my Christmas tie. Hope you like it, everyone. All right, moving on from that and getting back to the whole night photography side of things. As I said, there's a lot of preparation involved and I'm just going to check my notes because I did, of course, a little bit of preparing before air. Whew, it was so loose last week after the beer, I promised myself I would even knock up the preparation in case I got talked into it. All right, well, on my paper with the uh, preparation side of things, and I went through, you know, I sort of mentioned this a little bit already. The whole... Um, investing in gear side of things like the tripod you know this is this is not to be ignored in night photography one of the major reasons in fact when uh, you get to the whole investment in gear side of things or that discussion a lot of it can be around low light and night photography because that's where frankly the technology starts getting pushed I mean, even on a biological level, it's where our human eyes start getting pushed and all our other senses start playing around. 
So until the you know machines start making themselves and taking over, some of the tech is going to behave the same way. And low light photography gets very, very challenging. You might have noticed on your smartphone that obviously it doesn't go too badly. And if you're out there taking photos of the, the light trails of winter glow or, uh, you know, just wandering around the city at night, it can be reasonably well. But have you tried to zoom in on those photos beyond 20, 30 percent? Have you tried to print one up on a sheet of paper unless it was the brandest newest phone and uh, been a little disappointed? That's because the gear matters in this particular avenue of photography a little more than in other corners. And with that, getting on to the next segment side of things with the gear, I mean, certainly the camera we're carrying is something we're going to be thinking about, isn't it? I shoot two systems, as you boys and girls know, Nikon for the full frame side of things and Fujifilm for my crop censored APS-C system. They both serve different needs and they're different tools for different jobs, to put it another way. But I find when it gets down to low light, I'm leaning towards my Nikon a little more often than not. That's partly because it's got a bigger sensor than the Fujifilm. I mean, APS-C is certainly no small size sensor. We're talking about, let me just put this guy down. We're talking about a sensor about that big by that big on an APS-C compared to a full frame where you go a third bigger. So let's just rough ball it to around there. And by comparison, your smartphone has that as the sensor size. So when it comes to low light, even though I know Fujifilm do a medium format system, which is an even bigger sensor, I mean, then we're getting ridiculous. I'm always leaning towards my Nikon when I go into the low light photography side of things. That is an exclusive and some of the photos we're gonna look at in a bit are also taken on the Fuji film. But a lot of the time, full frame and that investment in the equipment is uh, one of the things I'm considering pretty heavily with my night photography. And speaking of which, and giving a little more focus to this absolutely huge badass lens, well, as you saw when I had the cap on, some of you may know this, which is Zeiss. They're one of the high, high, high quality lens makers that are uh, known around this game of photography. They've been around for quite a while and they specialize in high-end lenses, as in the optics are extra refined and tend to go to higher aperture numbers, which I'll talk about in a second. But this particular model is uh, something that I lean on in my day and night photography. But the fact that it's a little higher quality optics and, well, partly so big because it's a wide angle lens. This is another reason I'm leaning towards my Nikon system more than... Um, my Fujifilm system because of lens choices. You know, Fujifilm has been into the mirrorless camera game. They've been in the photography game for a long time, but the system I'm using now is only six, maybe seven years old. Nikon has been playing with this format of sensor size for a good 50 years, because it's the exact same size as 35 millimeter film. And not to uh, babble on and get too loose about it, but basically that means there's a lot more lens choices, including secondhand and older versions of lenses like this particular Zeiss I picked up, also part of that holiday sacrifice with the tripod. Um, and there's actually been a replacement of it. So if I want to get some glass that really kicks ass on a, on a little bit of a budget or you know considering things in a few ways, there is a lot of value towards the full frame system, whether it's Canon, Nikon, uh, and even Sony to a point, because you can also consider Minolta lenses. Personally, one of the reasons I ended up in Nikon in the first place and might even end up sticking with them as one of the factors to not jump brands when I uh, get my next full frame camera is the fact that I can use old lenses too. So very, very handy on the Nikon side of things and certainly something to consider. Now, this particular lens is also worth mentioning because this is uh, an f2.8 aperture lens. So I can open up the aperture all the way to 2.8. And for that, I'm just going to put this down for a second because I have this old 50 millimeter lens. And when we're talking about gear and lenses, I mean, this is, this is really something in night photography that really comes to the forefront, which is um, 
how much of an aperture can you open up on your lens? The lower the number of the f-stop, when you, when you see a lens and it says f1.8, 2.8, 5.6, 8, 11, 14, just to throw out a few of the numbers, it means that when the number goes down really low, you can open up the aperture just like you're seeing now, just maneuvering around some of our studio lights. And then, let's try it like that. When I close the aperture, so going to a higher number, I'm letting in less light. Big number, high aperture. Low number, low aperture. Or something like that. Jeez, I always get confused on air. Whew, live TV. Here we go, kids. Oh, here we've gone for about 12 episodes now. I'm getting used to it. Yes, so um, when you're considering your lens choices for night photography, think about the lenses that open up to a very high aperture. And the reason I showed you the physics of it all is, I mean, boys and girls, think about it logically. It's like water going down a drain. If you can open up that aperture to a nice wide opening, and in this case on f1.8, you're going to be able to take a photo faster than you will on a lens that only goes to 3.5 or let's say 5.6, roughly around there, probably around there. And with night photography, you know, the camera needs more time to soak in that light and make sense of it. So the lens consideration here is really gonna matter. I mean, to put it another way, a lot of the time, I'll use this 15 millimeter F2.8, and I'll also use uh, my 21 millimeter f2.8 lens, as well as a couple of other prime lenses when I'm doing night photography. The reason for that is that even though I've got to change lenses more, I can open up the aperture wider, and also the fact that with prime lenses, I'm going to be getting a sharper photo than a zoom lens will be giving. Now, to give you another context to it, as the wife helps the dog up the stairs, you saw her in the corner of the frame. She wasn't poking her butt out to twerk or anything. Blake is coming up to say hello. Yes, boys and girls, don't let the dog distract you. This is my Nikon 16 to 35 lens. You would think that logically I would use this a little bit more than I would be using uh, prime lenses since I, since I have to change lenses every time I want to change my focal length. But this lens, even though it's got the convenience of going from 16 to 35 with an easy zoom, it um, only goes down to f4. So if I want to get some nice fast shots, maybe with people involved, on some of these things during winter glow. This lens might do it, but it might not. And like you'll see in a minute, I mean, there's ways to work around it, but the convenience here is thrown off by the fact that I'm uh, inconvenienced by not having enough light flooding into my sensor when I need it. So all things to think about on the gear. I mean, I could talk about it more. There's a few more items on the desk and even on the camera itself, you can see I've added some accessories. There's a little plate on the bottom that I think is worth mentioning just before we move on. It's a tripod plate so that I can put more than one thing. I like to have this little accessory which lets me clip onto my uh, camera strap. And then of course the tripod mount next to it. So if you're looking for an option like that, leave me a, a line in the comments and I'll let you know what model that is. But overall, I think we can start hopping around to photos and talking a little bit about technique on that side of things. Because uh, at the end of the day, the gear ain't everything, and uh, we covered a bunch, didn't we? So let's take a little look and see if I haven't bored you guys to tears yet. If I have, you can tell me why not. Hey, what the hell? We all learn and grow by doing our practice and doing our thing. Nope, nobody's yelling, screaming, or complaining. So that's a nice thing. Let's just click over and make sure everything's working right. Yep, that means all's good here. And I can go back into the corner and we can get to some photos of the winter glued. Well, I mean, winter glued. Oh, actually, we can't go to photos of the winter glued because there's some more boring preparation to do. Ha ha, fooled you. There you go, back to full screen. Just say I fooled you. Yes, boys and girls, before we go to the photos of winter glued, let me just uh, go to the website because I talked about preparation here and you know I know I'm dwelling on it a bit and we are oh 45 minutes in maybe we will go over an hour but 
you know, preparation really can't be underestimated. There's other things like the practice and the patience, which is so universal to photography and night photography, especially so. But look at this. I mean, without even having to leave my house before I go to the winter glute, I can go over to the website over on bruge.be, B-R-U-G-G-E dot B-E, or just run a Google search for winter glute. And I have the full website from the city of Bruges that in Flemish at least, or Dutch, same language, shows me all sorts of useful stuff for my research. Look at this, the Licht Parcours, the Stelvoer, Kest, Kest ve, ve, ve Sering. We have to work on our Flemish before we do it on air. The Hood Om Weten, the Drukte Barometer, the Winter Load App, the, oh boy, Break Bar Heid and Pakiren. Goed. Thank you, Al. <laughs> We're working on the Flemish. The Winter Load Folder, the Winter Load Up Facebook, Mir Winterst Activiteten, the Takeaway for that local shop. And Kupje Kadoches for that shopping. And we're going to dip into this. Winterhlud 360 Raden. Yeah, you got to hear me speak <laughs> Flemish. We're working on it. We're working on it. And my, my wife says it's cute. So whatever. All right. I'll take it. Yeah. And if you uh, are not working on your Flemish, don't worry. You can over also go over to visit Bruges.be. V I. S I T B R U G G E S dot B E. And that's the uh, Tourist Bureau's website. It has many of the similar things in many more languages Netherlands, Francais, Deutsch, English, and Espanol, as a matter of fact. And you can see, aside from a couple things getting missed out, like unfortunately the local shops, which is a bit unfortunate, but it is what it is, we have all sorts of information that's going to help towards our planning. Now, I think the two main things that we can point out here for Winterhlood is not even just the light trail or the decorations and such, because, I mean, we can see this through other ways. But actually, I think the most important thing right here, well, first off, is the takeaway, because that means you get a nice listing of all these wonderful uh, places to eat. Unfortunately, it defaults back to Flemish, but you can see, I mean... It's a similar language to English. Minder than 10 euro, mean, minder than 10 euro means less than 10 euro. Tassen, tien and derte euro means 10 to 30 euros. Tassen, derte to and seste euro is 30 to 60 and so on and so forth over 60. And that means that while you're here at Winter Glow, you can feed your belly. You know, some people have been worried with all the restaurants and uh, so many things locked down here in this wonderful year of 2020, that uh, they won't be able to get something to eat. And I can confirm as well as show you how there's many, many places to consider. I could list off a few. I mean, Taddy's is right in front of me, and they are stupendous over on the Jan van Eyck Plain. Brasilia is a really nice spot for coffee. Po, what else we got? Uh, ba, 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 Le Coquette de Le Café is supposed to be really nice. And St. Servia, where you can get bagels, is always nice in Andy's book, because I love bagels. So yeah, <laughs> on the preparation side of things, just know you can grab a bite to eat. Also, all the fry shops are open. Vincent would be my first choice there. Let's see if he's even... Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, the man is not listed. Please, what is this? Ladies and gentlemen, Vincent by the St. Salvatore Cathedral is a really top fry shop near all of this with a winter glow. So just think about them. And, you know, hopping back and not dwelling too long on this. I think the other major thing we have to take out of this before we get actually into the 360 is the crowd barometer, which in Flams is the Drukte barometer. Yeah. I actually think this is a really smart thing. And I was at the press conference. If you saw last week's episode where I uh, saw the police chief and the mayor unveil this, this is a live update as accurate as possible based off of uh, cell, cell phones in the area of how many people are actually at winter glow right now. So if you look at the color chart, we have green for quiet, light green for pleasant, yellow for busy, and orange for extremely busy. 
And if we look at the times, this is the one on the Zend, which we'll see in a little bit in the photos. It's looking pretty mellow. And winter glow overall, right now there's a few people around. So there's a, it's very busy. And I can tell you as a, a bit of a tip, after 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, certainly by 10, there's a lot less people around. So this is where the, you know, the research and the preparation pays off. If I do one quick Google search and go to their website and start seeing patterns with the crowds and what's happening and what kind of activity, I can either avoid the crowds or embrace them as part of my photo night shooting just by looking at this little piece of information over here on uh, bruges.be or visit bruges.be. So really top idea. I mean, they were a bit flooded on the first weekend, so it was good that they integrated this into the program of everything. I will say actually just clicking over, I'm surprised it's not also on the Visit Bruges webpage, but hey, that is what it is. Oh no, here it is totally to the side. The Winter Glow app. If you click on this, you'll see how there's an app for Android and, um, and of course, iOS iPhone devices. Well, I got to say, boys and girls, I loaded this onto my phone to take a look to see if it was worth recommending. And it's not bad. I mean, it's a reference right there of all the installations, of which there are 10 uh, on your phone, as well as, you know, a quick button that says, go to Maps and show me how, this, how to get there. But I think just wandering around and doing a little bit of preparation, you should be good to go. And uh, actually, if I have any feedback for them, uh, if they care, I'd say maybe work in that crowd barometer and I don't know, maybe your takeaways, as well as reminding people they can do some shopping around Winter Glow. But hey, what do I know? I'm no web developer. I just do two websites and run a bunch of stuff as well as read violently about technology. Anywho, look at that. Click in tabs randomly to say, change the subject. Before we get into the last thing of Winter Glow, and then we'll look at a few photos before getting out of here, folks. Let me just check in online. Everything's looking good. We got no questions. That's all cool. No more comments about my tie. I am gutted. Come on. This comes from a dollar store in Canada. Leave us a comment, including how ugly it is. But yeah, on the Winter Glow side of things, as I say, preparation really does pay off. There is one more feature that I think is worth dipping into before we go to my photos, and that's actually the 360 view. You can see Winter Glow 360, and when you click on it, just like over on the next tab, it opens up a 360 camera shot of each location. I mean, I think this is good stuff to see because now I can do a full live check of what's going on at each location. You know, if you start at the beginning or just even come out of the station, you're going to have all these atmospheric Christmas lights. As you wander through, in fact, we don't even have to use the menu. I can just click on the next location of the route and then end up at the, the uh, what is it, the Purturin, the Gunpowder Tower. And as I spin around, I can get a sense of things, get an idea at least how many people are going to be there at the minimum in most cases. But, uh, you know, also just work out some logistics and feel out what I can do with the uh, course at hand. I really love that one. That's at the Behenhof. Behenhof. And skipping around, you know, I mean, just being able to go into a space even though this is a much more uh, dynamic and moving installation than it looks like on a still photo, I can still get a good idea of things and what's happening and maybe where I can stand and plan some stuff out. Preparation. Preparation makes a difference. Alrighty then. That is a bunch of stuff on the preparation side of things. I think we can also click over to some photos. Did any of you see that properly? Boy, do I hope so. Yes, now we're back in Lightroom. All right, boys and girls. Well, I talked about the preparation side of things, went through the website, went through some of the gear, all that sort of stuff. Seems to be making sense because I'm not getting any complaints or co questions of what? So that's kind of nice. We have a little bit of time left, so I want to just run through a few photos of winter clothes that I've caught for myself. It'll also demonstrate some of the advice that I've been talking about. And actually, you know what, since uh, we don't have that much time left, it's, it's in a way working out well because 
I haven't had time to do the full winter clothes yet. So this is almost part one of part two with just a couple of ideas in mind. Uh, and we're going to take this up probably after the new year. All right. Well, we've practiced, uh, we've, uh, we've, what have we done? We've done preparation. We've gone through the gear. We've gone, done that whole stuff. We've worked ourselves out. We've dressed warm. We've even done a little bit of stretching so that we're nice and limber for when we're out there working the night groove. I mean, what what can we expect from there as far as actually being out there? Uh, well, for me, I mean, we can expect a lot of beautiful because Bruges is beautiful and Winter Glow is beautiful. And I think Christmas as a theme looks beautiful. So there's that. I would say like in this moment, you'll probably want to get out a little bit early, if at all possible. You stand much more chance of the crowds. So like I say, if you want no people, maybe think around after 9 p.m. And certainly certainly remembering it goes till January 10th. So, you know, with the, with the Christmas holiday week ahead of us, you still have time after that to revisit and go back late. But if you happen to get out under the blue hour, which is the very end of the day, which of course is when the sky's a little more blue like this, you'll see the reward of it in the, the atmosphere and the mood of things. And sitting here on the market square with the uh, Christmas village or the tree village going on, I mean, we have a couple things we can play about and, and mess around with. We've got the wide shot, which I think works out well, especially with those people over there. And then just skipping through, you can see I've gone up close and played with it that way. I should also mention that with the full frame sensor, just dipping into the editing side of things, that I'm able to work with one single raw. And you can see it's from my Nikon, my full frame, all that sort of stuff. It was taken about a week or so ago. It was taken on the Zeiss, so wide angle. And if you look at, I mean, everything reset or at least turned off, Oh, where is it again? Bear with me a second, boys and girls. Oh, of course, I can't turn it off directly. But I've moved around the exposure, the highlights, the shadows, the clarity and the texture. And that's because if I'm shooting everything in raw, it's going to start off around there, even without undoing the clarity and let's say the texture. That's what it's going to look like off camera. But shooting in raw, I'll have the flexibility to maneuver and do this kind of thing. And I should emphasize, and this is part of the reason why I picked those particular systems, uh, both my Nikon and Fujifilm uh, cameras use Sony-based sensors. So the dynamic range is a little more flexible than, say, with Canon, who produce their own sensors. But don't let this put you off. And obviously, if you're not getting the kind of dynamic range you need, that kind of flexibility from the RAW because you use Canon, um, just start bracketing and thinking about taking three shots at different exposures so you can put them together towards an HDR. I happen with that flexibility that my D800 gives me especially to uh, shoot rather dark. So if you, we just reset these again, you can see actually that the sky is not really showing up so well. But the reason for that is you can always pull up shadows more than you can push down highlights. So while you're going to have that flexibility with the highlights there, and then the shadows now coming in, and then the exposure being pushed up all over the place, that uh, I'm getting a pretty good version of the dynamic range I need towards working with, you know, this particular lighting situation. If I need more, that's where I start doing bracketed shots and making HDRs. So food for thought. As is, you know, the beautiful unfolding of winter gloat, or winter glut, to keep it Flemish, Yes, uh, Winter Glow is offering me all kinds of opportunity, and you can see this one I'm playing around with as it gets even darker still into the evening. Right here, I'm using my Fujifilm. Oh, no, I'm also using the Nikon. So I have that flexibility in the dynamic range. And again, just hopping over quickly, you can see what I'm talking about there. In this case, I've just pushed down the highlights, and the exposure has gone up as, uh, as one of my counter moves there as well as some clarity, just to add a little more pop into things. It's always a handy slider to use in Lightroom, as long as you're not going too crazy to play with the clarity, just to get some nice sharpness and pop out of things. So a little thought there. 
And a few more thoughts as we roll through Winterclute and what we're doing around it. I mean, this shot you can see worked out fairly well. Uh, because I haven't zoomed in on this, it's a little more pixelated than usual, but it's also good because it's going to show you what I'm talking about in a second. I mean, again, backstage, the usual sort of business. I'm playing with highlights down, shadows up, and maybe the exposure getting kicked around all over. The main thing that you might notice as we get into the numbers up in the corner is that this is only taken at a third of a second. And thanks to that big bad Zeiss that's a prime that goes to f2.8, I can take that at f2.8. And I'm going to have to turn up the ISO really high. But because of that combination of shooting at f2.8 and turning the ISO up, it's only been a third of a second. And, you know, I get some nice clarity around people who are actually standing still. See that? That lady isn't doing anything except standing there looking at a phone, which is exactly what you should do when there's beautiful light and art in front of you, obviously. So she is looking good for a nice still shot, as is this gentleman at a third of a second. The one consequence of this, and, you know, it's a major trade-off to some people, is that because I shot at a 2500 ISO on the D800, which is a, about a six-year-old camera, at high ISOs, you start seeing this digital grain stop start to appear a lot more aggressively, don't you? And that's going to take down some of the beautiful, supple, you know, nice, rich black of it all when you get to your blacks and your contrasty vibes that we like to look for. And also it's going to bring out a little bit of the muck on the sensor lens a little more aggressively. You'll see the spot like right here, which of course I can just delete out of existence using the cloning tool. But you know, that higher ISO, I'm going to be paying something. And even when I do little touch-ups like that, the grain gets so finicky that you might notice that it's not exactly something that uh, works out so great for your particular tastes in photography. Now, for me, I don't mind. It's a give and take relationship depending on what I want to get. But it's something you are going to have to consider. And frankly, it's also where people end up carrying around bigger lenses than even that Zeiss. So they can go down to f2.0. Or they use a completely different focal range because those allow going down to f1.2 or even f1.0, which means less ISO, which means less grain, which means a couple nice pops to your photo. And moving through and just showing you a few things, you know, a little winter clothes. That's over at the Zen Square and you can see just how wide shot is paying out nicely, I think, in this respect. I'm not really going to dwell on it long, but I will point out the backstage that I did the usual edits of exposure, highlights, and shadows getting moved around. But also, I used a gradient tool. And this is some of the touching up you might do, especially with night photography, where you can see this bit that's going red is the entire foreground. And all I've done, as we select it and go here, is turn down the exposure and the highlights dramatically. Because without that, boys and girls, as a, who needs to see that? I mean, cobblestone's great, bricked road, great, but the story is about winter glued. <coughs> so I focus it on winter glued. A little bit of editing, a little bit of touching up, that's all part of it. And frankly, if you want to open up Photoshop or even do it in, within Lightroom where you try and take out that crane, double the building five times and do whatever you want, Photoshop in a more interesting sky, it's not really my thing, but it's all part of the art, so... Enjoy it as you figure it out and try and keep the story focused on winter load, not that foreground image of uh, bricks. And here's another image to play with. Whoops, we don't need, need to zoom in on that. This is also, again, playing around in low light. And I believe in this case, kicking around the exposure, highlights, shadows to get to where I need to be. The one nice thing when you do these long exposures, and that's what I was looking for, three seconds. Let's just go back to that. Three seconds at F9. Well, that opens up some of the little sparklies going on with the overhead pieces here. When I'm using an aperture from F9 to around F13, I start getting these nice little pinpoints of light, like you can see, these little crosses that are going on right here. And since there's no people or life moving through there, 
you wouldn't really notice what was going on, huh? You, you could think that's half a second at a high ISO, or it's three to 30 seconds. Things to consider, including this beautiful sight of Onze Lieve Fraukerk lit up as it is over the winter glow. And this is where you can see I'm actually using the, the uh, Fujifilm system, so the crop sensor. And you can see a little bit of extra grain popping up as a consequence of that. I mean, I have gone up to ISO 3200, so it's a little bit to be expected, whether it's full frame or a uh, crop camera. But certainly as I zoom in, I start paying a little more. Also, I have to say the dynamic range isn't as generous when I get to the crop sensor. So again, something that I'm going to have to consider, but... Still perfectly serviceable, depending on what you need. And, you know, just pausing there and flipping over to the old comments section side of things. We're all looking good, all looking fine. Everyone's quiet, but they're tuning in, so that's a good thing. Let me just make sure everything's rolling properly, because, of course, I do my own production. Yep, we're still on air. That's good. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, with Winter Glow in mind, I mean, it is... As you see, I think just an interesting subject overall. And the results start showing up with the gear. I mean, I talked a lot, a lot, most of this episode about the preparation and practice and investment side of things with the gear. But uh, that's, that's the result you get when you do the work. You know, something like that that doesn't look embarrassing. Something like that that doesn't look embarrassing. Something like that that might be a little bit grainy, but doesn't look embarrassing. Practice, uh, preparation, preparation, preparation. And in a way, I gave away what uh, I wanted to tip out next, which was simply about practice. You know, I mean, let's just hop over. They're a little bit out of order, but this particular installation over on the fish market, I'm just going to play it for you so you can get an idea of something that's, you know, going on in motion and what's What's the idea of it, if nothing else? It's actually got a lot of beautiful music that's made by the uh, Bruges. Oh, what is it? The Jungendienst or the one of the one of the youth groups here. They made the music, which I think I can play and nobody will be able to hear. But you can see lighting wise, there's a lot of motion life changing up of things and all that sort of stuff. When I talked about practice or when I mentioned practice, I should say, I mean, this is a situation where a little practice does pay off. I mean, there's the practice of taking more than one photo so that you have different options of where the balls are. All that individual motion means an individually different shot. So a little bit of practice towards, you know, realizing that no matter how quick you are, it's worth taking a few extra photos and doing it a few times over. I think you can also see that I'm moving around. Look at that. That's from one particular spot on the fish market, and that's another. So, I mean, a little bit of practice as far as moving around and not just settling for one angle and one shot, and especially if it's sort of the typical sort of shot that's being done of this installation or moment. That's a big payoff. And then, of course, moving around a little more dramatically, Moving all the way to the side and getting a completely different shot from that angle, I think is worth your while, as well as the practice of hanging out, waiting for the lights to change, going, I'm perfectly happy with it blue, but let's get a couple in red and see what it looks like on the desk. As well as some of the practice, you know, let's say, let's say just getting it even close to right so that when you get back to the desk and you're doing your editing, you're not pulling, you're pulling things round like I am with the exposure of plus 2.5, highlights down, shadows up, yada, yada, yada. But it's not more out of control. You know, I'm not shooting it this bright off camera and then trying to bring it down to here, which isn't going to be possible because once it goes too bright, you're not really going down so far. Oh, and hey, that's also another great example of where the high ISO is going to kick you in the face a bit. Even with a, uh, you know, full frame camera doing all the fancy stuff. This was taken at ISO 3200. So you can see that grain, especially when it's been kicked around too hard on the edit, really does start to add up. 
And if I don't do any practice as far as getting to know my edits, as far as, you know, getting to know how to expose my camera properly, as well as what to expect when I get back to the base, photo ain't going to work out even for something on the screen, much less uh, down the road, is it? And you know, with night photography, you should also practice, like I said, that end of the day feeling uh, as far as when you're shooting, whether it's winter hlud with light festival here on the Behenhof with these cool UV lights going down at this time of night, but also practice, you know, when it's fully dark and when you get the full effect of the UV lights and you might lose some drama in the sky or some feeling with the blue hour, but you get a really funky feeling for the surroundings otherwise. And like you can see in the corner of the screen, this is an HDR. I did my practice as far as taking HDR photography, taking one brighter, taking one darker, taking one in the middle, what kind of distance, whether it's one stop, two stops, three stops, and then what I do with it back on the edit, back on the computer. I could make this look much worse if I don't do my practice on the editing to uh, you know, learn that extra finesse that I think HDR in particular requires. So practice, 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 practice. And hey, another spot. We have a little more time. We've gone over the hour, but hey, when have I cared about that? Why don't I show you just a little more of Winterhlud and also just where uh, playing around and, you know, coming back to things and doing the practice really pays off. You can see this shot was when there were people. This was actually during the opening night. So there were quite a few people around. We did this and the opening of it, and that was about it before we said that's enough and ran away to home. It is 2020 and we're being careful. But you can see by returning on a Monday and getting some practice with no people, I get to practice this situation and I get to practice that situation. The fact that I'm making the effort and showing the love, like I talk about at the beginning of every show, means that I'm getting the long-term practice of when there's people, but when there's no people. And it is commitment, it is work, it is effort, but how do you think these photos happen? I'm not just going, oh, look, I have the feeling to go out to winter load. There's nobody there. I did my research through my preparation. I learned that evening times after 10, very, very quiet. I went out last Monday, nobody there. I get a very different situation from here. And then also, the nice benefit when there's no people around, I can practice a little more deeply. I can take 20 or 30 different versions of this location, play around with the stream of lights that the demo mode is giving me. Try that out and see what happens as an end result. And yes, that includes on the edit. I already did my editing as far as we saw earlier with pulling up shadows, pushing down highlights, maybe messing around with the exposure overall. But then I take it into Nick Collection, into the Color Effects Pro module. And since I've done my practice there, as well as a little preparation by practicing, I can do another tweak of it through that software so that I might do a little moving around afterwards but I'm taking it from there to there and having more to work with and more clarity in my image. And you know, also with practice, I left this one so that we could do it together as an exercise. Let me go to my brush tool and see that little bit of purple that's going on in the rooftops. Oh, it is there. Ah, there we go. We did it already. Yes, that little bit of purple that you see in the rooftops, I thought I had wiped it out. But boys and girls, with the brush tool, all I've done is I've gone to my greens. This is what it looks like without. And then with a little practice, with a little maneuvering, with a little playing on the edit, those small imperfections, especially caused by light trails and all this randomness going on, that can be fixed up and done right. It's just that simple. Do your preparation so you get out there in one piece and doing it right. You do your practice so that while you're out there or even beforehand, you're getting your technique and, you know, work in the scene the way you can. And then you take it from there. You take it back to the desk and do that practice, practice, and execution, execution on the edit and compilation. It's a way to play. It is a way to play. 
What else can I show you? I don't know. I think that's about it. We've certainly filled up an hour, so I think I've chatted plenty about winter load. Tell you what, here's one more from the Reutheus Museum. This is one of those photos that, again, I shot it off camera, played with the edit, got everything in order, took it in Nick collection and took it that little further. And, you know, this is also why I'm looking forward to going back to Winter Hlod and talking about it again on the show, because there were a lot of things going on there. And, um, you know, these silhouette dancers in the windows of these lit up windows. I'm not sure I really did them justice with this long exposure and how it turned out. And I certainly didn't get a second photo, even though I was there alone and playing around for a while. So uh, quite looking forward to getting back to that and getting my practice in there. Ah, night photography. It's one of the most challenging, like I said at the top. So it really, uh, don't, don't be afraid if it doesn't work straight away and don't be afraid if it takes a while. I mean, that star, that star setup with the foot panels that... Whoop, that you can play around with. Monday night, I spent about a, an hour there and I was happy to get three photos I was really uh, delighted with. Night photography goes slow. Johan, you asked if I use Nick Collection in Lightroom or in Photoshop. That is a very good question. Most of the time I use it out of Lightroom, but if I have to be a little more selective to the areas, I'll do it in Photoshop. The reason for that is in Lightroom, it's just a little quicker to move around and change about and get to where I need to be. I'm in Lightroom. I say work in Nick Collection. It makes a copy. Off I go. However, Photoshop does um, have the advantage that it adds a layer and leaves the file open. So, for example, just going over to that um, photo over there, if I had applied Nick Collection but prefer the sky to be a little more subtle like it was on the original shot, then I'm going to do it in Photoshop. And afterwards, I'm going to erase the sky on that second layer that Nick Collection produced. So very good question, but a bit of a different tool for different situation. Moment again. Hope that helps, man. You get a like for such a good question. Good work. And over here, we see that everything is looking good on the question side of things. I think that means that I've covered a lot of ground and not made a fool of myself this fine evening here in Bruges talking about Winter Hlod that is also here in Bruges. So I hope that was helpful. There is one last thing I want to add next to the uh, preparation and practice. And that's simply patience. You know, this is uh, also something that we either need or need to learn or get to learn through our photography. And in night photography, I find it applies plenty. I mean, just framing up a shot in the dark can be a little bit of a, a patience exercise on its own, especially if you're using wide angle lens, lenses as I tend to, where you're getting a lot in the shot and you have to make sure that you're doing best you can before you fire off. But I do find that patience with winter clued is a good thing to have uh, definitely at hand or consider when you're out there working your night photography. Tell you what, I'll just do this while we're talking. Actually, no, I'll do this. I'll go back to full screen. It's towards the end of the show. Yeah, the patient side of things really uh, just cannot be underestimated, boys and girls. I mean, whether it's waiting for people to get out of your way or be in the way like you want them to for the particular shot you want, whether it's playing with the gear to get the settings you want, and then even back at the edit, doing the extra work that can often be involved around night photography, a lot of patience will be required at some point, especially if you're still early to this. And I got to say on the patient side of things here in beautiful Bruges, Belgium, we also have to be patient with the weather because it's not the sunniest of times. And uh, well, we are known for having rain once or twice a year that tends to inspire such <laughs> magnificent beer and food, doesn't it? So patience, patience, patience next to the preparation and practice is my main advice well, for photography, but certainly for night photography. And also for a recap, just in case you joined late and feel these are too babbly to sit through on a recap, uh, you know, do your research in the sense of going over to the, the website for Winter Load, www.bruges.be or www.visitbruges.be. That or just a simple Google search of Winter Hlood will definitely uh, give you some ideas and some options there. 
and just think it out as much as possible. Invest in the gear, like I say, as much as possible. This is where you see the payoff if you're using a high-end lens compared to, uh, you know, something a little more tickety-tackety. And I guess we could say the same on the tripod like we talked about. And just overall, take the care and appreciation for what you're up to. Whether it's taking two minutes to blow some dust out of the sensor using this thing, whether it's figuring out how apertures work so you can do this and get the sexy shot. It's all part of the game and welcome to photography if you find this a little bit intimidating. Now, before we get out of here, I will uh, just thank you for watching this. I mean, I get a little bit loose and rambly on these live shows. We're still working it out a little bit here in episode 12. I mean, you can see I'm still broadcasting from the attic. So we're a real rinky-dink lo-fi operation. You might even be hearing my wife's phone beeping in the background for the entire episode. But no, hey, that's all episode. part of it. She can defend herself as much as she wants, but it is what it is. And that's all all right. And I hope you've been enjoying it. And uh, I hope it's been helpful. And if it has, please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and do all that good stuff. I hope you're also seeing on the live feed that we have a Facebook group called Andy's Big Time, Big Time Photo Fun Hangout Gang. You are more than welcome to apply for membership. It'll probably be granted if I know you and like you. And even if I don't, I might give you a chance. And I have to say to members already in that group that I will be a lot more active in that group come the new year. I've just been mostly getting out uh, and getting busy doing my photo work, as well as, of course, promoting my new book, which happens to be in the corner on top of the records, Bruges Landscapes Unlocked for Light. Look, there it is. Oh, and look, there it is in a real world up close kind of way. How about that? I remember to mention the book, the book that's come out in real world form. Oh, a blank page, another blank page, an intro, another intro, a full color photo, oh, double page, 28 centimeters by 28 on each page. So imagine that combined. Look at this, I'm a big guy and I find it big. That must mean that it's a product worth having and just before Christmas, there's still time. Bruges Landscapes, unlocked for light. If you don't have a copy, why not? Order one, they are a limited run in hardcover of 100. And then that's it. Maybe we'll do a soft cover down the road, but this large hardcover edition is a one-off of 100. And they are selling, so please don't hesitate if you're thinking of picking up a copy. And if you've got a copy, well, congratulations and bully to you, and thank you for supporting my work. And maybe even consider buying a second copy for that loved one. You have a copy, you know how gorgeous it is, you know how much it supports my work, and you know that the sooner we get rid of all 100 copies, the less I have to mention it on the show each and every time. Bruges Landscapes Unlocked for Light available through yours truly over at phototourbruge.com or just by leaving me a message, sending a smoke signal. I don't know. Yell really loud in Bruges. I might hear you. It's a fairly small city. Mm. Oh, and what's this? Oh, some other book that's out? I don't know. It's some local political humor and satire by some guys who are here. I, I think they're rather strange and the drawings aren't very good. The humor is rather poor and tasteless, but apparently some of you like it. And I mean, I have to make it look like I care beyond promoting my own book. So I guess if you have nothing better to do with your money and you want to support a couple of, of our local fools, you can consider buying Dictator Dirk 2 at your friendly local bookshop, Book Handle, Bookwinkle, or maybe just dig around for some toilet paper and you'll see some in the corner that look a lot like this. Oh! I do it because I love them, both the promotion and the dissing. Coon and Bart, I love your book. Everybody should buy a copy. I have mine, so there we go. That's the story for Dictator Dirk, as well as, oh, what is it? Oh yeah, Bruce Landscapes Unlocked for Light, a story of space, silence, simplicity, full Beautiful color. Let's just dip it open again. Oh, in black and white also. 
We've got to sell those copies. Please humor me, ladies and gentlemen. It's the end of the show anyway, so most of you are probably tuned out after picking my brain for advice in one way or another, either by listening, either by commenting, or just generally talking the next day and saying, did you hear what Andy was talking about? And going from there. I don't know, but if it helps you with your photography as well as entertains you through this magical Christmas tie from the dollar store in Canada, I like to think I'm doing my job. I don't have much else to do considering we're not doing photo tours right now as Photo Tour Bruges due to 2020 being so much fun, fun, fun. But it will be happening soon on the photo tour side of things. So uh, I guess enjoy this if while it lasts, if nothing else. Hey, maybe if you guys share, subscribe, and do all that stuff that gets us popular and all that, I'll be able to guarantee another 52 weeks in 2021. But for now, I can at least promise one more show at the end of 2020 next Sunday, 8 p.m. live on a Sunday evening if you're over at facebook.com forward slash Andy McPhoto. And if you're catching us on the replay, no problem. It is available at all times at that address. It's also available via youtube.com forward slash Andy McPhoto. Photo. Just to remind you there, because damn it, it matters. That way I can say this is all marketing when I write off microphones, webcams, and demo copies of Bruges Landscapes Unlocked for Light, A Story of Space, Silence, and Simplicity. The taxman likes marketing, so it's good. And I hope you found this good. That's all I have for this week. One quick poke to the comments, because I am the man of extended goodbyes. Yeah, ba, 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 ba. No, we're looking all good. We're getting a thanks from Johan. And I guess on that note, that means I can sign off, which means I can say thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in and checking out my Christmas tie. It is beautiful, is it not? <laughs> One more show to 2020, and that is next Sunday at 8 p.m. See you there over on facebook.com forward slash Andy McPhoto. But until then, I will not repeat website addresses, plugs, or the fact that there are still a few copies of Bruges Landscapes Unlocked for Light, a story of space, silence, and simplicity available through me. I'm going to say goodnight, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for watching. You know the score from here. It is time to put me down. It is time to pick up your camera. It's time to get out there, whether it's now or on a delayed basis, and get shooting. Do it. Do it now. Bye-bye. Happy Christmas.